What a lot of sentimental tosh is talked about London's black cabs and their competitors, notably Uber, the app which allows ordinary human beings to become part-time taxi drivers. Fundamentally, it's just another manifestation of the sharing economy and the disruptive technologies that are creating new industries. Using your car and an Uber app to ferry passengers around is just like having a spare bedroom and renting it out through Airbnb, which is another target for vested interests. In medieval times, workers faced with competition from new market challenges used guilds to protect their vested interests. Today, they rely on protectionist regulation, and in this case, Margaret Hodge, who's the chairman of the Public Accounts Committee, who claims Uber has opted out of the British tax system by basing itself in Holland, as it seeks a foothold in European capitals, all themselves home to cosy taxi cartels. There are two arguments here, and both involve fighting the future. In the days of satellite navigation, it can't make sense to require from taxi operators two or three years of moped-based cramming as they memorise remote byways they'll never drive down. The second is about tax. Uber, like Amazon and Google, transcends national boundaries. Consumers and businesses have accommodated themselves to globalisation. Governments and tax authorities are going to have to follow their example. The fact that EU members, Luxembourg, Holland, Ireland, compete feverishly to offer lower corporation tax compounds the problem. If Uber wants to base itself in the Netherlands, EU law says it has every right to do so. Maybe governments have to stop chasing corporation tax with its scope for minimising and rebasing domicile and focus on the advantages global corporations bring. Google's new European headquarters means a billion pounds being spent redeveloping London's King's Cross. That's a quantifiable benefit for any economy. Meanwhile, I look forward to Uber's founder, Travis Kalanick, outlining his plans at the IOD annual convention. One other annual convention speaker is Scotland's First Minister, Alex Salmond. We're told he's keen to attend, but his diary for the month after the referendum is a bit up in the air. He'll address us either as the leader of a new sovereign nation or as the man who didn't quite make it. As I write, most portents suggest the Union will survive, although not necessarily by a big enough margin to avoid independence turning into what some critics describe as a never endum. For its part, the IOD's position is clear. Whatever the constitutional arrangements, the historic ingenuity of Scottish and English business people will ensure their commercial relationship is maintained and thrives. Boris Johnson is heading back to the House of Commons. It's easy to see why. As a Conservative, he was elected and then re-elected in a Labour city. His popularity is near universal. I've seen business leaders, journalists, students, even schoolchildren rush across a room to hear him adoringly. No other politician could turn being stuck dangling on a zip wire during the Olympics into a personal triumph. Last year, Lord Ashcroft polled floating voters in Eastleigh, Taunton, Warrington and Leeds. Johnson was thought more likely than any other politician to be a people person, a winner, and someone who gets things done. More importantly, he appeals to those who feel distanced from conventional politics. At a time when the Conservative Party is vulnerable to UKIP, two-thirds of UKIP members favour him as a potential Prime Minister. Will he make it? Well, political leadership guessing games are notoriously unreliable. Leafing through a copy of Director from September 1964, exactly 50 years ago, one editorial paragraph reminds us that plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Let us be clear, the great choice facing this country is still private enterprise or state control. A dash of courage now, an affirmation of belief honestly held, could defeat the danger which stares every director in the face, even if some choose to avert their gaze. This is not playing politics. 
is plain common sense. My summer holiday was spent in France, and I still can't understand why France works so well. Every cherished economic belief suggests a country with government spending at 57% of gross domestic product, foreign direct investment down by 95% over the past decade, rigid labour market laws, militant unions and a 75% top tax rate should really be on the brink of collapse. Perhaps it's because the French simply choose to ignore vast swathes of EU and domestic regulation.